how do we balance the grid when we aren't ever really sure about the input energy we have that's going into the grid? Mm -hmm. Remember, a grid isn't a store of energy. It's simply plumbing. And if you try and put more into it than is going out of it, transformers blow up. So the grid operators need these large utility scale mining sites in Texas who can shed 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts for an hour, two hours, three hours a day, whatever it might be, um, to help balance their grid. Because otherwise, they're going to consumers and saying, guess what? You need to turn off your air conditioner when it's 110 degrees outside. Consumers don't like to do that. Hey, everyone, if you have been listening to Empire, you know that Santi and I are fed up with unaffordable fees and frustrating transaction speeds that make the on-chain experience basically unusable. So the Arbitrum team reached out and they showed us the platform. They showed us what you can do on Arbitrum. Whatever you're doing, you can experience frictionless transactions at lightning speed on Arbitrum. So head over to portal.arbitrum.io and check it out. What's up, everyone? Before we jump into today's episode, I'm excited to share Empire's first ever security partner. Harpy is the best tool to prevent your wallet from theft in real time. Harpy is not just a security solution, they are a peace of mind solution. But don't just take our word for it. Harpy is the only wallet security solution that protected 100% of its users from attacks like the Ledger one in Q4, which was an off-chain signature attack. To learn more about Harpy, click the link in the show notes or visit at harpy.io forward slash empire. What's up, everyone? Before we jump into the episode, little plug for Digital Asset Summit coming up in London, March 18th to 20th. Tickets are pacing so far ahead of schedule that we had to decrease the discount code. So instead of Empire 20, it is now Empire 10. Head over to the website, Digital Asset Summit, DAS London, March 18th to 20th. Use code Empire 10 and get 10% off your ticket. See you in London. All right, everyone, welcome back to an episode of Empire. Uh, not your normal Empire episode here. Instead of talking DeFi and ETH for Soul and all these kind of big infrastructure conversations we've been having, we are going back to basics, talking Bitcoin mining, which after this conversation, I think you will realize how not basic it is. But we have uh, I think no one better in the world to talk about this than Fred Thiel, who is the CEO and chairman of uh, Marathon Digital Holdings. So Fred, welcome to the show, man. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah good to have you here. So... I think the best place to start is actually just with a almost state of the union of Bitcoin mining. So we the last Bitcoin mining episode that we did on Empire was like mid-2022 with um, the folks at Galaxy and Foundry. And at that point in time, the kind of two years before that, you had 2019, prices sitting at 3 or 4K, things run up, we get a crazy bull market, everyone gets levered to the nines on ASIC financing. Um, and then obviously, it, you know, and some folks maybe were running their balance sheet kind of risk on, I would say they were holding the Bitcoin instead of selling it. They were doing like pretty remarkable amounts of uh, ASIC financing, just getting levered to the nines and then things blow up, right? Uh, market crashes, uh, financing obviously gets wiped out, leverage gets wiped out, ASICs pull back in the secondary market 70, 80%. And then I think a lot of folks kind of stopped paying attention to the Bitcoin mining space. You guys obviously didn't. You were headstrong here. So maybe give us like State of the Union and what has been happening in your world the last 18 months? Uh, gosh, uh, sit down, get a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you look at uh, kind of January of 2023, you know, Bitcoin's at around 15,000. I think our stock price was at around $3. Um, and it was doom and gloom in the industry. Um, 2023 was spent by the mining industry kind of rebuilding. Uh, you, know, you had a lot of bankruptcies. You had the, the um, core scientific bankruptcy that had hap just happened. And then uh, you had uh, you know the follow-on from FTX, et cetera. Um, so basically, people were ignoring Bitcoin mining, um, figuring it was kind of a dead industry, I think. Um, we had decided that it was time to, there's no better time to grow than when everybody else is kind of stagnant. We had ordered a lot of machines in 2021 that were delivered through 2022. And so we began deploying um, our capacity pretty heavily. Uh, you know, January of 23, we were at about 7x a hash. We exited 2023 at almost 25x a hash of capacity. So, you know, three plus times uh, the capacity. Um, we also focused very much on, on shoring up our balance sheet, uh, paid down debt, you know, ended the year with about a billion dollars in cash and Bitcoin and only about $300 million of debt. Um, and, uh, you know, 
December produced about 1800 Bitcoin, which was kind of an industry record, I think, uh, for a miner to produce. So ended the year great. So over the course of the year, you basically had some positive tailwinds in Bitcoin. Bitcoin price moved up about 3x, uh, you know, closed out the year in the, in the 40, mid 40s. Um, all the minor stocks ended the year very well. We were up over 500% for the year. So it's a great year for us. Um, but the whole sector moved up and people realized, wow, this is really profitable business again. And then, you know, miners started really investing in more capacity. And our industry really is constrained by three things. Access to capital, because it's obviously a CapEx intensive industry. You know, we pay hundreds of millions of dollars for sites and for miners. Um, access to mining rigs, because at the end of the day, there are a limited supply of mining rigs out there. Um, really only have three major producers. Now there are, there's a fourth that's entered, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but essentially, historically, if you go back to 2020, 2021, uh, you know, we placed a huge order in 2020 for uh, S19J Pros and kind of cornered the market. I think we ordered like 70,000 machines um, and kind of cornered the market on those initially. Um, and so access to capital, access to rigs, and the last is access to capacity to plug those miners in. So think of it as hosting sites. Uh, the longest lead time item is hosting sites. If you're going to build them, it's you know 12 to 24 months. You have to get them permitted. You have to get all sorts of agreements with power companies. You have to build it, order it, etc. Order transformers, which are long lead time items. Um, so typically, it's kind of you got to have sites. You've got to have uh, so you have to have capacity. You have to have miners to use that capacity, and then you have to have capital to pay for it all. Hmm. Um, and you know, in early 2023, nobody could raise money. Uh, it was a gruesome environment from a capital perspective. Um, there were um, an increasing number of rigs around and capacity was still rather constrained from all the growth that had happened um, in 21. And during 22, as the price of Bitcoin dropped, nobody was really increasing capacity. Uh, so over the course of 23, we started seeing um, you know, opportunities to growth. Um, and so uh, we definitely took advantage of that. The other thing, um, that really happened in 22 um, and into 23 was we helped uh, co-found a company called Oradyne, which is the only U.S. developer of ASICs for Bitcoin mining rigs. Um, or one of our board members, together with one of the uh, founding members of a company called Palo Alto Networks, founded mm -hmm. a company uh, called Oradyne to design uh, really a best-in-class mining rigs. And... Uh, Oradyne um, was uh, an idea on kind of an envelope, if you would, on the back of an envelope in January of uh, 23. And uh, here we are, and they're already on their second generation product, a three nanometer ASIC that um, in simulation shows that it should operate at about 15 joules of terahash, which is kind of wow. industry leading. Yeah. Um, plus, they've done some other amazing things. So, um, a lot happening uh, in that regard. You started seeing miners move internationally. Uh, you know, we established a big site in UAE together with the Sovereign Wealth Fund there, 250 megawatts. We've expanded also into Paraguay now. And you'll continue to see miners like ourselves, you know, move offshore more and more. The regulatory environment um, is looking uh, better. You know, the ETFs have been approved, which is a great thing. We're starting to see good flows. Uh, you know, there's a lot of liquidation from GBTC, uh, which was expected um, as people took advantage of the discounts that they bought those shares at. Um, and you're seeing, but you're seeing great inflows into the other ETFs, uh, which have been really positive. Um, but now you see the regulators are once again coming, you know, Senator Warren and company coming after Bitcoin with this EIA energy survey. By the way, no other industry has ever had to report on its energy use. Uh, this is highly targeted at Bitcoin miners. Um, you know, look at the AI industry. They are going to consume factors of magnitude more energy than Bitcoin miners. Bitcoin miners use less than 1% of the energy generated in the U.S. Um, AI is going to use considerably more than that. And um, yet this survey is specifically targeting Bitcoin miners versus AI. So, uh, you know, I think the administration is still um, antagonistic to Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, they had to give on the ETF uh, for legal reasons, um, but I think that the regulatory environment in the in Washington is still generally anti-crypto, um, and so it's going to be very interesting because this is actually a very important topic for the election. Um, 
one in five Americans owns crypto, uh, of voting Americans, a little over 52 million. This was in one of the papers the other day. Um, and when you think about that, uh, obviously, you know, people don't want to be told that what they're investing in is bad. Um, but the U.S. government's done that before. Uh, in the 1930s, the U.S. government forbade Americans from owning gold because Americans were buying gold instead of savings bonds. Uh, so um, not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but, uh, you know, there's precedent. Um, fun fun fact for you, Fred. Uh, the, I think it was the state of Massachusetts forbade uh, citizens of Massachusetts from participating in the Apple IPO. Uh, and that did not go too well I for them. I did not know that. So, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, you basically have an environment where, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, miners have recuperated their uh, public equity values. They're able to raise capital. They're buying lots of rigs. They're expanding. Global hash rates expanding, but Bitcoin price is staying relatively flat. Hmm. And this is where, as we get into the having, things are going to look really. Um, yep. It's going to be very interesting, right? Because uh, not all miners are in a position like Marathon. You know, with a billion dollars of cash in Bitcoin in the balance sheet, we have the ability to survive a severe downturn for years. That's not the case with a lot of other miners. You have miners like Core that have just come out of bankruptcy. Um, you have miners like um, HUD-8. They're not really a miner. They're an operator of mining sites for third parties. But uh, you know, HUD-8 has uh, just had a recommendation from an analyst that was a sell recommendation. That's very rare to see analysts go antagonistically uh, like that after a miner. So I, I think... We're going to be in a period of time where there'll be lots of consolidation. We've stated before, we'll continue to be a consolidator. Uh, we recently bought um, uh, a couple of sites from Generate Capital um, in Texas and Nebraska, and we're going to continue to consolidate both domestically and internationally. We think this is going to be a great period of time for growth. Uh, sovereigns outside the U.S. are investing heavily in Bitcoin mining. Their incentive is not the, the Bitcoin they produce, but the freedom to transact the Bitcoin that they hold. So what do I mean by that? If a sovereign holds Bitcoin as a reserve asset, they're still um, dependent on an ability to have access to places where they can trade that. And if they're not mining Bitcoin, they may be locked out of having their wallets transact on pools because of OFAC compliance requirements by the U.S. government on large mining pools in the U.S. or other places. And so they have to mine their own Bitcoin to guarantee that they can transact their Bitcoin. And so that's why you're starting to see a lot of sovereigns look at Bitcoin mining simply from a perspective of, I want to own Bitcoin, but I don't want to own Bitcoin if the U.S. government can stop me from selling it or using it. That's the reason why you see central banks are the single largest buyers of gold today. They're buying more gold than any other buyers out there because central banks uh, of non-U.S. central banks don't want to hold dollars because of the risk of the U.S. weaponizing those dollars. Hmm. Um, and so I think you're going to see more Bitcoin going into balance sheets of sovereigns. You're going to see companies start owning Bitcoin. Uh, two big issues that have made that more possible, the FASB rule change regarding Bitcoin and how you hold it on your balance sheet. And you can now mark it to market, opens up uh, Bitcoin as an asset that uh, corporations, not just banks and financial institutions, but corporations can now carry on their balance sheet um, transparently. And also the availability of the ETF, which really makes owning Bitcoin for corporations, financial institutions, retirement accounts, etc., as simple as buying stocks. So hmm. I think we're going to see a lot more Bitcoin becoming part of people's um, savings, retirement uh, allocations, investment allocations, uh, cash reserves, et cetera. Um, and that's only going to bode well for the price of Bitcoin long term. Short term, I think Bitcoin is going to be in a very choppy environment. Um, I don't foresee an immediate price bump around the halving because you think about the supply shock impact we're going to go from 900 bitcoin produced a day to 450 450 bitcoin in a day is not a big difference in supply uh, so uh, i think there may be a psychological bump because of the having um, you know historically it typically moves six months after the having so look towards october to december sometime um, and i think you know end of the year very positive likelihood that you know we'll see bitcoin at or near the all-time highs 
Um, and then, you know, it should really move in 2025 once all these ETFs have really started uh, bringing in dollars and you start seeing more and more people adopting Bitcoin. Um, so I'm very bullish on 2025. I think 2024 is going to be a consolidation year. And that nice. was a very long winded answer to your question. I, look, I asked for you for I asked, I asked you for State of the Union. So that was about as good of a State of the Union as I could get. There's a lot there. There's obviously the regulatory side. There's this idea of sovereigns and corporates buying Bitcoin. There's this idea of miners pushing more internationally. There's this competitive nature of what's going on in the public markets. Um, I think I actually want to start with, you mentioned, you brought up this interesting idea of you kind of have three inputs to your business. There's capacity. I think I remember this correctly. Uh, capacity, or maybe it's cap, uh, capital, rigs, uh, and electricity. I think those were the three. Yeah, inputs. Look, yeah. No, yeah capacity. So capacity is a hosting site that has power. Or you can plug your miners in, so okay, it kind of embodies uh, so you know, we've got, uh, power. Like those, and, those, and, all right. So we've got these inputs for your business. What when I think about a miner and I try to simplify it as much as humanly possible, and I'm putting myself in you know Fred Teal shoes here. I'm saying, how do I compete? My understanding of miners is that the you've got all these things like regulatory pressure and capacity and rigs and all this stuff. It is it comes down to cost of capital, or it comes excuse me, cost of electricity. How cheap. Uh, what what is your cost of power basically? Is that the best way to? Is that the main way that you compete in the mining business? And and how do you guys think about like accessing power and cost of cost of power and things like that? Yeah, well, you ha you have to be careful how you use the word compete because mm. we no miners have customers. Our customers are really our investors, right? Because we're custodians of our investors' capital. You know, they're looking to us to generate the highest return and create the most market value um, for their capital. Uh, and, you know, so you look at our market cap and you look at what people have invested in. And clearly in 2023, we were a good bet um, up you know, over 500 um, percent. So it's not you know, we don't compete head to head with other people other than we compete for capital. We compete for capacity and we compete for access to rigs. So it's more supply chain competition, if you would, than um, demand competition. Because, you know, it's a commodity. So just like oil, we're selling our Bitcoin when we do sell Bitcoin uh, on the same exchanges as everybody else. And so we're really competing for capital rigs and capacity. Um, so to compete for capital, uh, you know, you have to have an attractive balance sheet, which I think, you know, we're most probably the strongest balance sheet in the industry um today um when it comes to competing for capacity and rigs you have to have capital to be able to buy rigs you have to have capital to be able to um buy uh capacity and so i think again strong balance sheet is the key thing there and i think we're positioned extremely well for that uh your cost to mine a bitcoin really is one component so it's your power cost plus your hosting cost if you would your cost to mm. operate the sites but your SG&A is also very important. So think of it this way. It, let's just say it costs you $15,000 to mine a Bitcoin, yet your SG&A is $10,000. It means your real cost to mine a Bitcoin um, all in, your cash cost is you know over $20,000 of Bitcoin. Um, now you could have somebody who has a higher energy cost where their cost to mine a Bitcoin is maybe 17,000, 18,000, but if their SGNA load on top mm -hmm. of that is only two or three million, they are actually much more competitive. One of the things that Marathon was built on initially was asset light, very agile. We're going to grow really fast, quickly, because we believe um, you have to get the scale very quickly. Once you have scale, you can essentially amortize your SGNA across a much bigger platform. You know, Marathon is just under 60 people. So we have, when you look at our actual kind of headcount, um, it's very low compared to a lot of our peers when you look at the amount of capacity we have, which means our SGNA load is fairly low, amongst the lowest in the industry. Um, but because we grew through working with third-party hosted partners, um, sometimes when people look at our cost to mine, uh, they look at a number which is energy plus hosting, yet when they compare our cost to our competitors they're just looking at energy costs so it's not quite apples mm. to apples comparison um, so you really have to look at the uh, the all-in numbers when you're doing it and over time yeah it becomes critical uh, today we have shifted our business model from being fully asset light meaning relying fully on third parties 
for hosting, which was, by the way, a great way to grow to the scale that we grew to last year. Um, now, 44% of our capacity is owned and operated. Hmm. That's a pretty big swing. And over the course of this year, you will likely see that number grow considerably so that more and more of our capacity will be owned and operated, which will continue to lower our cost to mine. Um, the other thing that you don't always, uh, that people don't always take into account when they're looking at cost to mine is sometimes the energy arbitrage people do is essentially credited back against their cost to mine, which is why you'll see some miners say, oh, we had a negative cost to mine Bitcoin this month. Well, yeah, they did energy arbitrage, but you know, of their four, five, six, seven, eight exahash that they had running, how much actually ran for what percentage of the month um, versus were they just parlaying their ener low energy cost and selling that? So uh, I think that's another area you have to look at. But over time, it really comes down to your total cost to operate. So what's your all in cost to operate? And, um, you know, can you do that at scale? The interesting thing with Bitcoin mining is that, um, once you reach about three cents a kilowatt hour in cost, and this is not including energy arbitrage. So, you know, there are a lot of miners who say, oh, my cost is 2.1 cents. Well, but net out the energy arbitrage and it's really three point something, mm. right? Solar energy costs typically about 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Wind is there or a little bit more. Natural gas is typically in the 2.7 to 3.8 cents. There are a couple of places you'll find hydro sites with lower cost, and you may find some old legacy uh, power purchase agreements that some miners have for stranded energy, which could be a little lower than two cents. But generally speaking, average energy costs across the industry, not including energy arbitrage, are in the high twos to low three cents a kilowatt hour, and in some cases, a little bit higher. Um, that's a floor. The you know the gas natural gas prices aren't going to crash to below one cent anytime soon, and uh, you know these long term power purchase agreements that a lot of miners have uh, aren't going to change because they're five to ten year agreements. So as the difficulty rate continues to increase and global hash rate increases, all of those miners are under the same pressure. Their single biggest input cost is energy, and that energy cost isn't going down. What we're doing differently, I think, than a lot of other people is we operate similar to our peers, utility scale mining sites. These are large, you know, 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt sites where we're acting as grid stabilization partners to the utilities. We can curtail whenever they need it. We can do energy arbitrage, et cetera. The other part of our business that is nascent is energy harvesting. And this is where we are using Bitcoin mining as a consumer of otherwise fully stranded energy, like methane from landfills, like methane from biomass, uh, like flare gas from oil fields, et cetera, where there is a benefit to not just the environment, but to the industry and to the energy provider of us taking that methane and turning it into energy. Plus, if we can take the heat generated by our mining systems and feed that back into an industrial process, you know, I did a presentation some months ago about shrimp farming and heating greenhouses and heating homes with Bitcoin miners. If you are able to do these types of businesses at scale, then your cost of energy could potentially be zero, which means you're mining Bitcoin for simply the capital cost. Hmm. And so an area we are very actively exploring is energy harvesting. And you know, you're not going to build 100 and 200 megawatt sites doing this. You're going to have to build thousands of very small sites. And this is one of the reasons we invest so much in technology, because we believe Bitcoin mining sites should really be able to operate under self-control long term. Uh, our site in UAE that we built um, last year, uh, the pilot site, uh, which ran in the uh, kind of the late 2022 it ran for over 100 days before an engineer had to open a container and look inside. Wow. So if you can lower your operating cost to the point where you can only have to look at your miners on a planned maintenance perspective, then now you can really talk about things like heating buildings. You can talk about uh, heat input to industrial processes. You can talk about recycling energy. You can talk about all sorts of things 
that all of a sudden where the Bitcoin mining operation is really just how you're generating heat for something. And then you're getting paid for that heat, right? Because Bitcoin yeah. miners when designed properly will capture 95% of the input energy and exit that as heat, exhaust that as heat, hmm. especially in liquid cooled systems. And we believe we have some of the most advanced liquid cooled systems out there. So uh, we're excited about that. Uh, do you have to worry about uh, geopolitical and macro risks when it comes to power rates? Things like what's, you know, Russia, Ukraine, Middle East, like how does that impact your business? Um, so as an example, in UAE, we have a long-term agreement with our partners for power supply. Um, we're not particularly concerned regarding regime so risk. You're logging in, in energy rates years in the future. Yes. Okay. Uh, in, in Paraguay, um, and, and to be fair, you know, uh, a government can give you a contract for multi-year energy providing uh, provisioning and there could be a change in government and all of a sudden some Jeeps roll up to your site and people sure. say, thank you for building this site for us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that risk will always exist. Um, I think to, Ru to the point on Russia, you know, Russia has nuclear energy that um, is readily available at about 1.9 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and Russia is the second largest country for mining in the world today. U.S. is number one, Russia is number two, China is number three, and then there's a long drop off uh, as you go down the list. Uh, you know, Kazakhstan, I think, is number four, the way you go down the list. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, Russia is uh, mining more and more Bitcoin. And uh, again, I think it's for the to ensure the ability to transact Bitcoin much more so than mm. generating profits from Bitcoin mining. Because I mean, let's, you know, there are roughly almost 20 million Bitcoin that have been mined to date. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. The last Bitcoin will be mined in 2140. So, you know, investing hundreds of millions of dollars in rigs to mine Bitcoin uh, as a sovereign is much more about ensuring your ability to transact the Bitcoin you buy in the open market and that you collect through trade versus originating Bitcoin through block subsidies and transaction fees. So when I, uh, when you thought about like, if you flash back a couple of years, the like instit as institutional miners were like becoming a thing and this was becoming like a, you know, folks were spacking or going public or whatever you want to say. Uh, the, I think the two counter arguments to that folks would have is uh, this is all centralized in China and it's really bad for the environment. It feels like the, China counter argument obviously got pushed out when they when they cracked down on mining. What is the, I guess what when you are in the room with like the institutional crowd, what are they do do they still have the pushback to, uh, you know, but mining is bad for the world because when I look when 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 I look out at the world, it seems like the ESG narrative is kind of dying down and not becoming as big of a thing. But do you think that's just because we're in a coming out of a bear market and we'll as you know Bitcoin goes back up, that will become another. Yeah, you know, that'll, that'll come up, become another big thing. Yeah, so, I mean, th there are uh, lots of different actors in industries that are either, uh, you know, are very well behaved and do good things for ESG. And then there are others who are just focused on maximizing their profit mm -hmm. dollars. So yeah. when we talk to investors, um, we talk very much about a sustainable industry. So how do you make Bitcoin mining a sustainable industry? Well, for Bitcoin mining to become sustainable, it has to generate its own energy, for one thing. Um, because the single biggest argument against Bitcoin mining is not that it creates all sorts of carbon dioxide, harms the environment, etc. It's It's taking power away from consumers. Now, this is a false narrative, but listen to me uh, for a minute. So you know, the Elizabeth Warren argument is, well, it doesn't matter that you're using stranded energy um, because if you weren't using it, then that energy would be available to consumers when they need it. And now consumers have to go pay higher prices. And yes, there are a couple of cases in New England where cities did cut deals with Bitcoin miners to provide them with energy and didn't think about the fact that they may need some of that energy back in the summer months. And so they those cities had to go out and buy energy in the open market, which, yes, was more expensive. But if you look at how Bitcoin miners operate in Texas today, um, because of the fact that there is so much renewable energy in Texas, wind and solar, I think over 40% of the energy there now is renewable. 
that is intermittent, meaning, hey, when the clouds pass over the sun in front of the sun, guess what? Your solar energy generation drops. When the wind stops blowing, your wind turbines slow down and stop. And so the grid operators there are stuck in this challenge of how do we balance the grid when we aren't ever really sure about the input energy we have that's going into the grid? Mm -hmm. Remember, a grid isn't a store of energy. It's simply plumbing. And if you try and put more into it than is going out of it, transformers blow up. So the grid operators need these large utility scale mining sites in Texas who can shed 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts for an hour, two hours, three hours a day, whatever it might be, um, to help balance their grid. Because otherwise, they're going to consumers and saying, guess what? You need to turn off your air conditioner when it's 110 degrees outside. Consumers don't like to do that. So when you really look at the role Bitcoin mining plays in grid stabilization, it is a key role because you don't have enough battery technology out there. And if the grid operator would have to turn on a peaker plant um, to generate excess energy, then yes, that would be very expensive energy. But hmm. because they have Bitcoin miners who can shed load, those peaker plant operators don't get the opportunity to turn on. And if you look at who are the biggest protagonists against Bitcoin mining in Texas, it is the operators of battery farms and the operators of peaker plants. It is not people worried about the environment. Um, so, you know, as we look at the ESG narrative, what you're going to start seeing is, um, you know, you had this wave of, oh, we only want to invest in green Bitcoin. Well, the 20 million Bitcoin that exists today aren't green and um, the remaining million, some portion of those will be green. But the minute yeah. they go into a wallet where there's a Bitcoin that wasn't green, that Bitcoin right. is no longer green. Wait, so just, to, just so I understand that last part, Fred. So yeah. in, in your experience, there are some utility companies that maybe specifically in Texas that are actually less hostile because they know that the miners are going to bring a large demand to the network. And this could then help them balance their demand on the grid network. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's the demand response mechanism, right? It's a hmm. it's a guaranteed load, meaning you have the demand, but that demand can be you have an agreement with the client, the miner, that you can shut off, curtail that load if and when needed. And so you know, remember, the grid operators don't want to have lots of power generation if there isn't demand, because right. that just drives pricing down and then people go out of business. And so by ensuring that the solar and wind sites have guaranteed offtake for their energy, um, they ensure the viability of those projects. And at the same time, they ensure availability of excess capacity when and if needed. And if you look at ever wow. since the winter storm URI in Texas, um, miners have played a critical role in helping balance and stabilize the grid during you know, winter events and summer events. Um, and the ERCOT grid has never been more stable. So. All right, I mentioned them in the pre-roll. Now I'm going to bring them up again. It's Arbitrum. Santi and I are really fed up with these high fees and we're really excited to have teamed up with Arbitrum for the next couple of months on Empire. As the leading Ethereum scaling solution, Arbitrum now powers hundreds of decentralized apps across DeFi, perps, NFTs, gaming, and a whole lot more. The team has showed us everything in the ecosystem, both now and what's to come, and we're really, really excited about it. Arbitrum allows both daily users and developers to interact with Ethereum at scale with low fees and faster transactions. The way the team got me excited was through portal.arbitrum.io. So my call to action to you is to get started by visiting portal.arbitrum.io. Go experience on-chain like it was meant to be. For a lot of Empire listeners, your crypto is not just another number on a screen. It's part of your future. I know Santi and myself feel that way. Our security sponsor of this episode, Harpy, takes this responsibility seriously and is the only wallet security tool that shields users from both on-chain threats and sneaky off-chain signature attacks. If you've ever been in that situation where you're moving quickly, you approve something on-chain, you realize that the address might be a dubious address or you're really hoping that you can take that back, 
Harpy has you covered. Harpy can redirect your assets to your self-custodied vault, ensuring they remain completely under your control, safe and sound. With Harpy's always on monitoring, you're not just detecting threats, you're actively blocking and recovering compromised assets from malicious transactions before they can even confirm on-chain. Harpy is the only wallet security solution that protected 100% of its users from attacks like the Ledger one in Q4, which was an off-chain signature attack. So if you're serious about protecting your crypto investments, it's time to make the switch. Secure your wallet for free at harpy.io forward slash empire. That's harpy, H-A-R-P-I-E dot I-O forward slash empire. If you want it to be even easier, just click the link in the show notes. So how do you then navigate the complexities of utilities in the U.S.? Where I feel like, I mean, I don't know much about them, but I feel like every part of the country has different regulations and authorities seeking different outcomes for their very localized customer base, localized weather patterns, geographies, like how, yeah, how do you, how do you navigate this? So, um, you know, you build relationships. It's like any business, which is complicated, um, uh, and where there are mission critical risks, uh, it takes time. You have to build relationships with the utilities. You have to build a trust, um, that, you know, Hey, if we give marathon access to a couple hundred megawatts of load, are they going to be good? citizens and curtail when they're supposed to, et cetera. So part of it is your, are you a reliable potential partner to the grid operator? Mm. Um, sometimes it's partnering with the energy generator. Uh, so in the case of one of our sites in West Texas, we partner with um, NextEra Energy who owns the wind farm adjacent to the site. And so, you know, we're taking excess energy off that wind farm where otherwise they wouldn't be able to sell it because of grid congestion. Um, and then we use grid energy to balance out the rest. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, it's really, you build these relationships of trust where people, you know, get to a place where they feel comfortable. You'll do what you say you're going to do. Uh, and it's not just a wild, wild west anymore. And so the grid utility operators, uh, the energy generators, you know, they are becoming more comfortable working with the industry leaders a because we're public companies b because we you know have large balance sheets we can afford to do what we say we're going to do um and you know they have history and track record of you know where we currently operate and that we've been great partners so um i think it's really more like in any industry as it matures certain parties uh, are just more trusted as partners than others yeah. but it, it's a it's a complex process you know you need to have load studies done, you need to have permitting done, you need to, uh, you know, there are lots of hoops you have to jump through. Um, and which is why it can take multiple years to get a project off the ground. Yeah. How many folks work at Marathon? We are 59 people, I think today. 59. Nice. Um, how do the four year cycles play into your how you run the business? I know I noticed you said, your billion dollar balance sheet is not just cash, it's Bitcoin. So there's there's a decision that was made there by you or your finance team that said, all right, we've got Bitcoin. We're going to keep holding this until a date at the, in the future when we think it makes more sense to sell it. Um, I'm sure there's an infrastructure decision there. Like right now, you said in the bear market, you guys were foot on the gas, plugging things in, getting the site set up. Is there going to be a time in two years, maybe end of 2025, 2026, where you say, hey, look, we think we think it's getting a little toppy right now. Let's start pulling back. How does this impact you, like you as the operator? Yeah, a great question. So we spend a lot of time developing models um, to try and predict where we think Bitcoin is going to be and where we think global hash rate and network difficulty is going to be so we can understand where hash price is. Um, we are constantly looking at the end of the day at our average weighted cost of capital. And so if, if we're going to grow, do we believe that it's time to grow in the marketplace? Yes. How do we want to fund that growth? Do we want to use cash? Do we want to sell equity? Do we want to use debt? Do we want to sell Bitcoin? And so we look across the assets in our balance sheet and we look at, you know, what is the average weighted cost of each of those uh, to use them? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're believers in the fact that the price of Bitcoin, we think, will start moving up towards the end of this year closer near to uh, where the prior all-time high was. And then in 2025, if we follow the typical historical cycle, we would hit a new all-time high that's most probably somewhere between one and a half and two X the prior all-time high. 
uh, and then we would go into a bear market. Now, that's only if we follow historical patterns, realizing that with the ETFs and institutional investors, we may never go back to that pattern again. And Bitcoin may behave as boringly as gold. Not that I'm saying it will, but, you know, that's the kind of downside scenario, if you would. So we're constantly weighing where do we think the price of Bitcoin is going to be relative to our CapEx cycle? Do we want to use Bitcoin to pay for things or do we think Bitcoin's going to appreciate by more than our average weighted cost of cash, debt or equity? And if we think that Bitcoin's going to appreciate more than our average weighted cost of cash, debt or equity, then we'll hold the Bitcoin and we'll raise capital through debt, selling equity or just use cash off the balance sheet. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at the, uh, you know, today, that calculus is, you know, somewhere in the high teens, low 20 ish percent uh, when you look at average weighted cost of capital. Uh, and so we have a very high threshold on new investments. If we're going to do something, it has to pencil uh, very well. And uh, otherwise, we're, you know, making pretty significant investments on our technology business. Um, I think you'll see a lot more news from Marathon this year, especially around some of the advancements we're doing in technology that play not just inside Bitcoin mining, but across the full data center spectrum. Uh, and no, we're not going to start mining and not, we're not going to start operating AI data centers. Um, but uh, that being said, we may very well provide infrastructure to them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, kind of the Levi's jeans model, right? You know, sell jeans to gold miners instead of trying to mine gold. So, um, yeah. What, uh, what do you think about what Sailor's doing? Um, you know, uh, Michael is a, a close friend of ours. Um, you know, he really opened up the um, people's eyes to the fact that Bitcoin was uh, an asset class that corporations should invest in by, you know, putting uh, action to his own words and building one of the biggest Bitcoin balance sheets uh, out there. Uh, so we're very grateful for him in doing that because that's obviously created um, appreciation in the price of Bitcoin, but it's also shown companies how you can leverage your balance sheet to accumulate a large amount of Bitcoin and the positive impact that can have uh, on uh, your market cap. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, uh, MicroStrategy's market cap prior to, if you net out the Bitcoin is, you know, a billion, somewhere over a billion dollars. Um, but with all the Bitcoin, it's, you know, considerably higher than that. Hmm. So he clearly paved the way yeah. for a lot of us. Um, uh, you know, I think that with the ETFs now, you, there's certain you have to look at from an investment perspective. There are different degrees of um, beta and risk and volatility. Uh, so for the majority of people who just want to accumulate Bitcoin over the years and have it as a store of value, hedge against inflation, and just a place to store value, uh, you know. Bitcoin ETF or owning spot Bitcoin make a good deal of sense. If you want to get the benefit of how MicroStrategy leverages their balance sheet and can use debt um, and convertible bonds, et cetera, as a way to um, collateralize and buy more Bitcoin, uh, that's kind of a hedge fund approach. Uh, and so there's a little bit more beta in MicroStrategy than there is in just spot Bitcoin. Then you have the miners, and this is kind of the Warren Buffett analogy, where you know he never wanted to own gold, he wanted to own gold miners, because the commodity production cost is relatively consistent, but as the price of the commodity goes up, a lot of profit is generated that isn't captured in the change in price of the commodity itself. And so if you look at Bitcoin miners, especially very liquid ones like ourselves, I mean, we trade 30 to 50 million shares a day. Um, Hedge funds and traders love our stock because you can move in and out of it very easily with large amounts of capital. Um, and you get the benefit that when Bitcoin moves 2%, we typically will move 4%. When Bitcoin mm -hmm. goes the other way, we go the other way, again, with the increased volatility. So there's more beta, as investors call it there. And so depending on your risk appetite and how you want to trade it, you go for miners or you go for MicroStrategy, or you go for spot Bitcoin or a spot Bitcoin ETF. Um, so I think there's ample room in the market for all of these. And, you know, MicroStrategy is a great way for certain people to yeah. uh, get a little bit of extra juice. Yeah. Do you really think that corporates should be buying Bitcoin? 
I think that any uh, company that is worried about debasement of whatever their corporate fiat currency is, you know, most companies have an internal currency. They, you know, multinationals are either going to operate in dollars or they'll operate in euros, but they'll pick a currency to do all their internal accounting. Um, you know, if you're worried about um, currency being debased and there aren't assets that you readily can invest in that will hedge against that debasement, such as gold or some types of real estate or uh, certain commodities, um, then you have to look at where you're going to put your money, right? I mean, if um, the expectation is that the inflation is going to remain around 3%, which is highly likely, uh, and the U.S. has to service its deficit of 33 plus trillion dollars of debt, um, then, you know, long term, if unless the U.S. develops an appetite for fiscal austerity, which clearly is not the case, then they are going to have to print more money, which means they're going to have to increase the debt load, which means the dollar has to drop in value. And so if you're holding dollar denominated assets, then you need to make sure those assets will appreciate as the dollar goes down in value. Uh, and, you know, the uh, politicians love uh, when asset prices go up because people feel wealthier. It's the wealth effect, right? It's why you look at China, people invested two thirds of savings in China were in real estate because apartment prices and real estate prices kept going up all the time. So in the U.S., if the people see the stock market go up and they see real estate prices going up, people feel wealthier. In reality, they're becoming poorer because the dollar that they earn in salary buys less every day. And so I think over time, corporations will view Bitcoin as one of many places to hold cash. Uh, they may hold cash in certain bond instruments, which are highly liquid. Um, but I think as Bitcoin volatility matures, uh, which it will over time, I think Bitcoin will definitely become some place that corporations hold a certain percentage of their assets on the balance sheet. I mean, we hold an inordinate amount of, uh, <laughs> of, of our uh, assets in Bitcoin, but that's because we're in the industry. It's kind of like a yeah. gold miner holding onto gold. Right? So BlockWorks is a media and information business. We have folks who will pay us in various tokens, right? Whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, we like USDC, um, but sometimes it's other things and we have to make a call. Do we buy it or do we, or, I mean, do we sell it as soon as we get it or do we hold it? And I remember getting Bitcoin at 18 or 19 K and help me out here with the prices fall in the fall, maybe 21 K. I forget the, I forget the actual prices, but um, yeah, that uh, there's just no way. <laughs> I mean, as someone in the industry, there's no way you're selling that. So how does hash rate impact your, like what, what's going on with hash, hash rate these days? And like, how does that, yeah, I guess what's going on with hash rate these days? Yeah, no, more and more compute power is being applied to the network. So hash rate's going up. Uh, it's a combination of people upgrading their uh, mining rigs from, you know, machines running at 30 joules a terahash to machines running at, you know, 21, 22 joules a terahash. So you know, you're increasing efficiency by a third, roughly. Um and so, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is if you have a, a site that has 10 megawatts of energy and you replace the miners that were using 30 watts per terahash with machines that use 21 watts per terahash, you can put a lot more terahash online with the same amount of power. Mm. Right. So now you remember the equation was you need to have capital, you need to have capacity and you need to have rigs. Well, if you use the same capacity, but your rigs are one third more energy efficient, it means you can essentially add one third more hash power at the same cost of energy. Um, so what you've seen over the past year is a lot of people deploying S19 XPs, for example, which are 21 joules per terahash or 21 watts per terahash versus the J pros, which were in the 30s. And so you're seeing some big efficiency increases, but it also generates more hash rate. Uh, you're also seeing a lot of sovereigns coming online. Hash rate growth outside the U.S. is much faster than in the U.S. today. Um, so you're seeing a lot of hash rate coming online in Russia. You're seeing a lot of hash rate coming online um, in parts of Asia, parts of Africa, South America, and uh, other places. And you're going to continue to see that because there's still a lot of 
cheap stranded energy outside the U.S. Um, and you don't have to deal with quite the same regulatory risk. You have regime risk. You have all sorts of other risks. Um, but they're different risks than in the U.S. So I personally think you're going to continue to see hash rate grow until we hit the halving. You'll see a bit of a hiccup as people realize, um, you know, if Bitcoin stays at these levels, um, you know, a number of miners are going to have to basically say, OK, how long am I going to be essentially paying to mine Bitcoin versus shutting down? And so you'll see the less capitalized, more uh, shaky balance sheets uh, succumb quickly mm. to either bankruptcy, sale, uh, consolidation, or just shutting down mm. and waiting to fight a better day when the price of Bitcoin returns. Uh, the challenge is not all. You, you think those folks won't just, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you, but you, you think yeah. those folks won't just, um, they won't die as businesses. They might just, like uh, you know, quotes around this, unplug their power and then plug it back in when the price is higher. Yeah, it all depends on how their power pricing agreements, their PPAs, their power purchase agreements are written. If they have a take or pay, they're toast. They basically are going to pay for the energy regardless. So they might as well mine Bitcoin at a loss in the hopes that the price of Bitcoin will swing back. And if it doesn't, they eventually declare bankruptcy because they can't pay for their power bills. Um, and so, you know, the, the uh, kind of perfect storm for this industry is you see energy prices move up, you see Bitcoin price move down, and you see capital become unavailable. Hmm. That will create a uh, major consolidation of the industry. And uh, you'll see a lot of people in trouble, which is why it's very important, you know, like Marathon, to have a lot of cash and Bitcoin on your balance sheet um, because it's this is a long game. Yeah. And you've got to be able to survive. Uh, you've got to be able to survive for multiple years, potentially, in a worst case scenario. And, you know, we're very focused on longevity and resilience. And, you know, we're, we're definitely going to be there to pick up the pieces uh, when everybody else falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. Um... The last cycle of Bitcoin mining can be categorized by just massive amounts of, I, I, I was going to say leverage, but I think all of crypto, the last cycle in general, not just mining, could be categorized as the cycle of leverage. What do you think the um, financing and leverage uh, will look like in Bitcoin mining over the next like two years? Like who, who comes back into this world? Um, you know, it used to be BlockFi, Blockchain.com. Uh, a lot of these players are... I mean, blockchain.com is still around, but a lot of the big uh, financing players, Genesis, they're no longer around. So will new people just take their place? What, what will this look like? Um, well, you know, where there's an opportunity to make money in financing infrastructure, um, some capital providers will obviously appear. I mean, if you look at the last cycle, um, folks like Nidig and Galaxy ended up becoming very large miners because of the fact they had to repossess a lot of miners. Grabbed all the up. ASICs, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they ended up, they, they are now very large miners. Um, and, you know, they are the types of miners who will likely not go out and buy new rigs to replace their existing rigs because their existing rigs will not be energy efficient enough to be profitable post having. So, you know, this is where you may see hash rate drop off um, quite dramatically you know there are a lot of people trying to uh you know exit the business now before things get bad because they think there'll be some a higher value today than than post yeah. uh, the having and we'll have to see but um you know it's it's a very hard uh business to lend on on rigs because um you know, it's so dependent on things that nobody controls, price of Bitcoin and global hash rate. And so, you know, so many people have been burned that I think the, uh, and with interest rates being where they are today, the cost of capital for the financing partners is very high, right? I mean, you know, if you want to go buy a car or lease a car today, you know, you're going to pay north of 8%. Um, the, you know, risk-free rate of return today is somewhere north of 5%. So, that means that, you know, capital that's going to go into this is going to be 20-ish percent, you know, interest rate most probably. Uh, and so you may see some people do rev shares where, hey, listen, you know, we'll give you 50% of the cost of the miner, and but we're going to take 80% of the revenues that this miner produces until such time as 
you know, we've been paid back. So you may see some crazy deals like that. Mm. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, you can't go public as a miner today. You know, I think there may be one or two miners that have been trying to go public for a couple of years that may actually get public. Yeah. The question is, you know, at what cost, uh, what valuation? Um, you have people like Core Scientific that just came out of bankruptcy. They still have, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of debt that they need to service. And, um, you know, they are doing deals with people like Bitmain who are financing machines for them against rev shares. So the question is, you know, at the end of the day, is there enough margin left in the business? When you look at the old machines, they currently have the new machines that Bitmain is financing for them and the debt servicing they have to do to survive long term. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the only way to really survive long term in this business is to pay down your debt and have a lot of cash on the balance sheet, a lot of Bitcoin, and then be opportunistic and buy rigs when they're cheap, uh, which they still are, buy capacity when it's cheap and uh, mine as much Bitcoin as you can. There you go. If only it was that easy, Fred. <laughs> uh, what is a, do you have a dream acquisition? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. And we don't really talk about it because the minute you talk about it, people come to you and say, guess what? We've got your perfect target. And uh, <laughs> but yeah. this is the price. Um, so but what I will say is that, um, you know, there are a lot of people out there who think that if they have a site that's mining Bitcoin today, um, that that pr that site should be priced for an acquisition uh, based on future cash flows from the mining rigs they have. And, you know, the typical kind of m and model. And that's just not the case. You know, um, there have now been a number of deals done. The deal we did, uh, you know, I know CleanSpark just did a couple of deals, smaller acquisitions, where, listen, it's an infrastructure deal. You're going to pay a certain price per megawatt of energized capacity and nobody cares about the miners that are plugged in there because they're typically too old otherwise you wouldn't be selling the site and so um and people are looking at these sites for self-mining they're not looking at it to operate a hosting business so the future cash flows that the site will generate don't enter into the equation at all so i think you know anybody who's out there thinking of selling a site listen the market price is around four hundred thousand dollars a megawatt and that's just what the market price is. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, people come to us all the time and say, well, you know, our, you know, discounted cash flows, terminal value is this. And when you apply marathons <laughs> multiple to it, we should be valued at X. And it's like, <laughs> nah, it's not uh, how it works, my friend. It's not how it works. How uh, so you guys are, what, what's your valuation today? Four, four billion, three and a half? Uh, yeah, it's a little over four billion, I think. Four. All right. So let's play a game. If you guys... If you guys, be, uh, if Marathon becomes a hundred billion dollar company, what will the shape of that business be? Um, so, Marathon uh, at that scale, you'll have traditional utility scale mining will be a portion of the business, likely twenty percent of the business. Uh, you'll have a portion of the business will be energy generation uh, of renewable uh energy um so we're not going to operate gas-fired plants or coal-fired plants or nuclear power plants uh but it'll be some form of renewable energy um you'll have energy harvesting be about 40 percent of the business and the balance will be technology hmm. uh what, what do you mean by the first thing traditional utilities so that's traditional mining, large scale sites working with uh, utilities okay. to stabilize the grid. So, Got it. you know, you look at what we're doing in UAE or what we're doing in Texas, you know, that's large scale sites, multi hundred megawatts where you're balancing the grid and you're acting as a partner to solar energy, wind energy, hydro yeah. energy uh, providers. Uh, and, yeah, you know, over, over time, the business tends to will tend to morph and vertically integrate around energy generation, energy harvesting, and yeah. then obviously technology. So. Are there, bear with me if this question doesn't even make sense, um, are there players in the energy stack who aren't in Bitcoin mining right now, but who you think could be or should be in the same way that someone like uh, a BlackRock wasn't in the Bitcoin game, but they realized they have a massive base of customers who are investors and now they're offering them a new product. Are there, does that, is there something similar for Bitcoin mining and the traditional energy players? 
So, uh, you know, I think if you look at how companies like Brookfield were created, you know, they were energy producers at one point, and then they became energy traders. Um, I think there, uh, there's a natural fit between Bitcoin mining and energy um, and all sorts of energy. Um, I think uh, as you look at small nuclear, small modular nuclear, so SMRs, as you look at um, other utility scale power generation, um, and as you especially look at microgrids and uh, battery systems, you're going to see a symbiosis, a uh, very symbiotic relationship between Bitcoin mining and those industries. In microgrids, for example, um, you have, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges today in the energy world is transmission. You could build a solar farm in the desert to generate more than enough electricity to cover the whole U.S. with power, uh, cover the whole of U.S.'s power needs. The problem is you can't get the energy from that place to the grid because you have to build these transmission lines. It costs $2 million a mile. Uh, the uh, utility operators that own those uh, transmission lines won't build it until you've already built your renewable energy site. You can't get your renewable energy site finance to build it unless you have offtake and you can't have offtake unless you have transmission lines. So there's this loop that is a bit broken in that area. And so Bitcoin miners mm -hmm. provide that guaranteed offtake. Yeah. Um, so what ends up happening though in microgrids is you're generating power and consuming it in the same place. So there's no need for transmission. And California is doing something unique, which is where before if you had solar on your home, um, you had net tolling, um, where basically your energy from your solar panels went into the grid at a certain price per kilowatt hour. And then when you consumed energy off the grid, you paid that same price per kilowatt hour. So it was net tolling, right? I put in so many kilowatts, uh, I take out so many kilowatts. Um, California then adjusted the pricing effective this year, where if you don't have batteries in your home, to store energy, you don't get the benefit of net tolling. You will be paid a lower price for the energy you generate than the energy you consume. But if you have batteries, you still have net tolling. So why do they do that? Well, it's the incentive for people to deploy net battery systems, because if you deploy battery systems, the way the uh, grid agreements work is the utilities can borrow energy from your batteries when they need it and pay it back when their cost of energy is much lower. And so you think about all these EVs plugged in and all these Tesla power walls, the utilities love it because you're generating electricity, you're putting it into the grid, you're filling your batteries. And when the utility needs it, they can pull excess energy off your batteries and they didn't have to pay a penny of CapEx for any of this. Hmm. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But you as a homeowner or you as the owner of an industrial park or a commercial real mm -hmm. estate facility can also opt to put some Bitcoin mining next to that because you can then do energy arbitrage around, hmm, am I better off selling energy to the grid, just putting it in my battery, or should I use the energy to mine Bitcoin? Huh, super right? interesting. And now you'll eventually have battery and storage systems that are connected to marketplaces that are doing energy arbitrage on behalf of the energy generator, i.e. the consumer, the, you know, you and me. Yeah. So everybody could become an energy producer and actually subsidize their costs by trading energy through some form of automated marketplace. So I think the huh. future of energy is around localized energy generation microgrids. I think Bitcoin mining plays a very important role in that mix. Um, and I think you're going to see Bitcoin mining become a part or portion of all sorts of industrial processes that are energy intensive, which allow people to generate arbitrage off of that. So yeah. that's where I think the future is long term. I think I'd ask a similar question about the hundred Marathon is a hundred billion dollar company. What percentage of the business is done in the United States versus elsewhere like Kazakhstan or the UAE or Paraguay or elsewhere that you mentioned? Uh, I think we'll be 50% outside of the U.S. Would you be more in the U.S. if the regulatory environment was more friendly? Um, no, I don't think there's enough energy. Mm. You know, the competition for energy is going to be hot and heavy. Um, and I think there are lots of places around the world where there's stranded energy that's cheaper than in the U.S. And 
will eventually figure out how to take advantage of it. And, you know, at the end of the day, Bitcoin miners are constantly chasing lower cost energy. So um, it's, you know, fast forward 2028 and, you know, likely Marathon will be generating its own energy, harvesting energy from other sources, using that to mine Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, there are places in the world where that's easier to do than in the U.S., uh, because it's easier to get these sites permitted. You know, there are places in Chile, for example, in the high desert where you could build uh, many, many square miles of solar panels, uh, but there's no offtake. But if you put a bunch of Bitcoin mining there, then all of a sudden that becomes really interesting. Yeah. And as you get more and more energy efficient machines, um, you know, it starts becoming real interesting. So, hmm. uh, Fred, maybe we could wrap it with, just a broader conversation around institutional adoption. You mentioned sovereigns buying Bitcoin at the very beginning. We talked briefly about corporates buying Bitcoin. What is your like mental model for just Bitcoin adoption in the world? And specifically, just because your customers are the institutional investors, like with that institutional crowd, the sovereigns, the large pensions, those kind of folks. So I think... Uh... Let's look at a couple of things. Uh, there are 52 million holders of Bitcoin in the U.S. who happen to be of voting age. So that's one in five voters in the U.S. own crypto, some type of crypto. Um, so that tells you that there is a broad um, acceptance and interest in crypto, uh, high percentage of which is Bitcoin, uh, by the under 45 crowd, millennials, Gen Z. And this is actually becoming such a large block that it is becoming politically important for the election, presidential election, especially, and congressional elections, because these are people who are believers in crypto, uh, and it is becoming a, a voting issue. Um, so who doesn't own a lot of Bitcoin today? It's the over 45, and really it's the over 60 crowd. So like myself, I'm a baby boomer. Um, and if I talk to most of my peers uh, who don't work in the industry, they would say, yeah, Bitcoin, but, you know, gosh, don't really understand it. You know, I prefer just a 60-40 stock portfolio, et cetera. They do listen to their registered investment advisors and their money managers. And, you know, the baby boomers are the single largest accumulated pile of wealth in this country. Uh, and it will eventually transition as baby boomers pass their wealth on to their children to the millennials and Gen Zs. And so a percentage of this wealth is eventually going to transition into crypto. Secondly, most RIAs today are reading reports that show over the past 10 years, no asset has outperformed Bitcoin. Over the past 10 years, a uh, risk-adjusted portfolio of just adding one or two percent Bitcoin to your 60 40 stock bond portfolio mix would have generated a much larger return you know these RIAs are eventually going to convince some of the boomers to say you know what yeah one or two percent fine put it put it in there if it's going to give me a better return and if it's going to generate more for an income for me and so you're going to start seeing now that the products are available that allow RIAs and wealth advisors to put their clients into a safer version of Bitcoin in their mind, which is called an ETF, where they have no worry about security, they have no worry about custody, et cetera. Then, you know, I can only assume you're going to see greater adoption. And what that means is price of Bitcoin has to go up because if there's demand, there's a finite supply. And you know, Bitcoin is a very thinly traded commodity when you look at daily volumes. And as more and more Bitcoin goes into these ETFs, what's going to end up happening is you'll see a shift uh, as Bitcoin price continues to move up where the long-term holders will eventually liquidate, take some profits, and then the, that Bitcoin will float into the ETFs. And the ETFs will become the largest holders uh, of Bitcoin, essentially becoming the institutional holders. Hmm. over time and that'll provide a lot of stability to the price of bitcoin um and i think what you're going to end up seeing is the institutions are going to start essentially recommending more and more adoption of bitcoin as an asset class now that's in the developed world in the developing world bitcoin still fulfills a huge role relative to self-sovereignty of assets 
you know, there are uh, billions of people on the planet. Actually, the vast majority of the inhabitants of this planet don't have bank accounts. They don't have access to bank accounts. But you know what? A large percentage of them have access to smartphones. So crypto and Bitcoin are ways for them to be able to have self-sovereignty over their assets. There are places in the world today where women still cannot have a bank account. Bitcoin and crypto provide vehicles for them to be able to have self-sovereignty over their assets. There are people who live in um, you know, uh, areas where there are wars, there are conflict zones. Having their assets in crypto and Bitcoin allow them to be able to essentially keep their assets safe from confiscation, et cetera. So there are all sorts of reasons in the developing world for people to adopt it as well. Lastly, I think what you're going to start seeing now, um, and the, the trend is already there, you're seeing more and more developers starting to build applications on the layer two of Bitcoin um, because Bitcoin's the most secure network out there. And it is the perfect network for anything having to do with ownership or title because of how it works with the UTXOs. And so you're going to start seeing initially first digital identity based products where basically um, if you have a certain token, which is registered on the Bitcoin blockchain, you will have a digital identity that is verifiable without anybody having to have access to the underlying documents. So think of it as a zero knowledge proof, but you'll have essentially have a token that you can show to a bank, you can show to government official, you can show to whomever that verifies your identity. Uh, you will also have similar systems for health data. You will have similar systems for ownership of other assets. You will have similar systems where governments and corporations will publish data in a way that can't be altered so that there is a source of truth for that data. And I think this need of a common source of truth that is inalterable, you can't ransomware it, et cetera, is going to drive more and more applications on the layer two. Uh, and then you'll also start seeing more transactional systems. You'll start seeing these AI-based platforms needing to do commerce with each other. Uh, you know, it's one thing when your car drives through a toll system that it can pay its own toll. But as you start developing AI agents who actually execute things like supply chain management using an AI-based platform, those systems will eventually have to be able to transact and write smart contracts, et cetera you'll see these systems being developed to run on top of Bitcoin um, and other blockchains. And I see, and when you see that level of adoption at that point, um, you know, you'll see the world moving more and more towards these automated digital platforms. And Bitcoin just becomes one of the many ways that things are settled in those blockchains. Yeah, very much so. Fred, this is a fascinating conversation. I appreciate you coming on. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Wishing you all the best of luck this year. And uh, yeah, I'm sure this won't be the last time you're on the show. So thanks again. Thank you. Much appreciated. Hey, everyone. Jason here. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Wanted to take a quick second to thank today's title sponsor, Arbitrum. We know you are tired of on-chain experiences that have unaffordable fees and frustrating transaction speeds, and that's why we partnered with Arbitrum. You can experience frictionless trades, lightning speed, and lag-free transactions, all for pennies per transaction. Explore Arbitrum's expanding ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io. That's portal.arbitrum.io. Io. See you for the next episode. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's episode. Really hope you enjoyed it. We wanted to take a second to just remind you about our upcoming Digital Asset Summit in London, March 18th to 20th. Santi and I got your back. Seats are limited. If you heard it earlier in the podcast, there's a little competition running at Blockworks to see who can drive the most number of tickets. So when you register for the Digital Asset Summit, make sure you use our code. See you in London.